A few years ago, my friend Tez and I set out on the Great American Road Trip. We were going to drive from New York to Los Angeles, zigzagging through the country for six weeks. We were both in our early 20s, pretty broke, and as my mom had been a long-haul trucker, I suggested that to save a ton of money we should sleep in the back of our hatchback. It was a pretty cozy setup. We bought some blankets and sheets at Goodwill and cut one of them to make up curtains. By the end of the first week we got so we could set up our camp in about 10 minutes. Luggage moved to the front, curtains up, bedding laid down and out for the night. We slept in parking lots, free campsites, rest areas, basically anywhere it seemed safe and semi-legal. There was never a night, after the first night, where we felt scared, until the last week of our trip in Arizona. We were near Flagstaff and we had gotten pretty used to our routine. We didn't go on a set schedule and would never drive more than three or four hours a day. No destination really in mind, outside a few must-see landmarks. We'd drive to places we found the night before on Google and take suggestions from other campers, locals, and people we met. We'd also gotten very good at making friends. We went to Denny's with a group of rednecks we met at a campsite. In the back of their pickup we met an 80-year-old cowboy who took us out drinking and taught us to line dance at the country bar, played the guitar with some musicians in the middle of a thunderstorm, got fed breakfast and dinner by tons of campers who invited us to hang out with them, spent the 4th of July with a family who basically adopted us into their campsite, grandma gave us some weed candy. Basically every encounter we had with a stranger was a positive one. This one night didn't look to be any different. We found a free campsite on Google and drove up into the woods, following our GPS. We were pretty far out of the town and something seemed a little bit off when we pulled up to the campsite. There was one RV parked and two cars further up in the trees. We pulled up near the RV and a man opened the door. Tez waved hello and he just stared at her. His expression was completely blank. Then as if she hadn't said anything, he slowly closed the door again, staring at us the entire time. Figuring he just wanted some privacy and thought we'd be obnoxious, we pulled further down the road and found a flat spot to park the car. Instead of our usual routine of setting up camp immediately while it was still light out, we goofed around for a while, smoking and laughing and taking dumb photos of ourselves. Tez pointed out a campfire further down the campsite, and we decided to go be friendly. We'd met so many cool people in the previous five weeks by just going and offering beer or chatting, so we wandered over. Near the campfire there were two men, the owners of the cars we'd seen earlier. They seemed friendly and we sat down to chat with them. They were drinking and smoking and we sat down and had a beer with them. One of the men seemed pretty off, and we came to find out that the two of them didn't actually know one another. The older man was definitely on some sort of drugs. He was spinning in circles and talking about UFOs. However, he seemed harmless. This left us chatting with the younger man, who claimed to be a former park ranger. He was handsome and easygoing, and we spent several hours just chatting about our trip, families, everything. Then he started to talk about the bear. He'd seen a bear earlier in the forest. Tez didn't believe him and he pulled out his camera to show her photos of the bear. It was very close to the campsite, and we were both a little freaked out. It wasn't unheard of for one of us to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, so the idea of a bear hanging out in the night spooked us. The ranger just laughed, and then his expression changed completely. It's hard to describe, but his voice seemed somehow cold. He said, If you get out of your car in the middle of the night, it's not a bear you should be worried about. I kept waiting for the laugh, or for him to nudge Tez with his elbow. Joke's on the foreigner and the city girl, right? He never did. I laughed awkwardly and made a dumb joke about serial killers in the woods. My friend laughed as well and joked about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We moved on to another subject, but within five minutes the ranger had come back to it and was talking about something grabbing us from our car in the middle of the night. No matter how we tried to steer the conversation away from serial killers, he kept latching back on. The older man was high as a kite at this point and was staring at the stars, not talking. We'd just awkwardly laugh and sip our beer and try to keep the conversation going somewhere else. Then the ranger stood up and walked towards the cooler to get another beer. At this point it's pitch blackout, and I can't see anything outside the circle of light from the campfire. The beer cooler was outside of that circle. 
Suddenly there was a red dot in the darkness, and it took me a moment to realize that it was a camera. The ranger is holding a camera. He had taken a photo of us. I could see the screen on the digital camera light up. Now, it wasn't odd for people we met to take pictures with us. My friend Tez is gorgeous, dark hair, blue eyes, like a young Megan Fox, and we were friendly. People like having pictures of themselves. It was an entirely strange thing to have the person taking a photo of us, without asking or even indicating that that's what he was doing. We were both just staring at him like a deer in headlights at this point, but instead of realizing what he'd done was a bit weird, he checks his camera, adjusts some things and takes another photo, this time with no flash. No asking us to smile, no proposing a group photo, and no explanation. After this photo, he comes back to the fire and sits down. Not a word said about the photo. At this point, me and Tez are mutually freaked out. We make some bullshit excuse that we need to go set up our campsite and nope the hell out. When he stands to leave, the UFO guy smiles and says to have a good night. Ranger, however, looks at us with a smile that doesn't reach his eyes and says, Be careful out there. There's more than bears in the woods. Every hair on my body stood on end. I wasn't alone in my discomfort either, because Tez laughed a response out and pulled me away from the campfire towards our car. We rushed back to the car, which we only found in the dark by referring to the RV, and jumped in the front seats. My friend Tez is still hyperventilating. Why did he take pictures of us? I was shaking. I responded. I read that serial killers sometimes warn their victims. She stared at me for a second and locked the car doors. Do you think he just took victim photos of us? We both freaked out. She's in full panic mode and turns the headlights on in the car. I immediately yell at her to turn them off, because now he knows exactly where our car is. God knows why, but that is the only night we didn't set up our camp. We didn't need to tear anything down, so we just put the car in drive and floored it out of the campsite. As we got onto the dirt road, Ranger was walking towards our car with that same cold expression. This takes place in October 1977. When my mom was 16, she ran away from her abusive home along with her friend Lisa. They hitchhiked from Massachusetts all the way to California. Obviously, this wasn't the brightest of plans, but given my mom's tumultuous home life and past experiences, she didn't see how it could be much more dangerous than anything she'd already experienced. They have a pretty safe and uneventful trip across the country, finding friends in many truck drivers and other travelers. It wasn't until they'd reached California when this encounter happened. The Hillside Strangler, at first thought to be one assailant, ended up being two men who were caught and brought to justice for ten murders. So my mom and Lisa end up meeting these two guys who were super nice to them. They crashed at their place for a few days, partying, but nothing bad had come to it at this point. These guys would tell the girls that they're going to take them to Hollywood Hills and Sunset Boulevard to see the sights. Not being from the area, my mom had no idea that these areas were more crime-ridden at the time, especially considering they were supposed to be sightseeing. My mom really wanted to see where all the movie stars lived. These guys take my mom and her friend to some divey restaurant slash bar and get them super drunk. It's also the first time my mom is introduced to and tries cocaine. After these underage girls are now completely high and drunk, they split off into pairs and my mom's friend disappears with one of these guys. My mom is now hanging out with just one of her new guy friends. He then suggests that they stand by the sidewalk on Sunset Boulevard in the middle of the night and if slash when a car pulls up, she should get in and direct the driver to drive across the street to this dark parking lot. It isn't really until the first, and only, car pulls up and she gets in that she realized that this guy was prostituting her out. Keep in mind, these guys had been nothing but kind and respectful to my young mom and her friend for the past few days. Also, and very sadly, this type of abuse is not a new concept for her either. She gets into the car and instead of pulling into the parking lot, he keeps driving straight. My mom explains that he's gone the wrong way, so he starts driving faster. My mom moves towards the door but he locks it, hits her, 
and then attempts to hold her down all at the same time. He tells her that she isn't going anywhere. My mom knew in her head that she needed to get out of that car or she's dead. So in one swift move, she unlocks the door and tucks and rolls out of the car. His car comes to a screeching halt. She sees some bushes in front of a house, so she runs and hides behind them. He's turned around looking for her, creeping along. His passenger side was facing where she was hiding and she was peeking through the bushes. She saw he had a gun. As soon as his car crept by, she ran to the backyard. It was all fenced in. There was no other way out, so she had to go back the way she came in. By the time she crawled back into the bushes to see if he was still around, she saw his car had gone to the end of the road and had turned back around. So he passes again, and when she thought he was finally far enough away, she crawled out from the bushes to run. But then she sees his brake lights. Confident that he's now seen her, she runs as fast as possible around a corner, but she could hear his car so she had to duck and hide behind parked cars on the road. As soon as he passes again, she books it across the street which took her through the parking lot she was originally supposed to park in, and back to her friend. The creep did circle back again, but by the time she was with her friend and they were leaving the area. My mom and her friend quickly ditched these two assholes and did find a safer place to stay. But only a short time later did my mom call home and eventually made it home safely. It wasn't until a long time later when she saw a news story about women being murdered and recognized the murderer, dubbed the Hillside Strangler, as the man who had picked her up that night. I was fired from my job last winter in retaliation for cooperating with the police and refusing to help my shady-ass employer cover up a felony, which was a bummer. Luckily, I found a great new job really quickly. However, my start date wouldn't be for two months because I was replacing a woman who was leaving for maternity and wouldn't be returning. I was having a rough and stressful time trying to make ends meet because in addition to having crazy high rent due to living in a big city, I have medical problems slash bills with that as well as I'm going to a private grad school and have to pay my tuition myself. I racked up a few thousand in credit card debt during these few months, and while I knew I could pay it back once I started working again, I was pissed and stressed out and trying to pick up some odd jobs and temporary work to ease the burden. I picked up a couple of gigs off Craigslist. I babysat, did some tutoring, a couple of things like that, mostly working with kids. I spent an entire day at an accounting firm helping them shred boxes upon boxes of God knows what for five hours, with just a regular shredder. But I made $100, which was cool. One day I found myself a research study. It was supposed to be about $80 for two hours on a Sunday morning to watch videos of something or another while they visually observed your responses. Weird. Whatever. Research studies are usually weird. Seemed like easy money. I filled out the survey which asked some basic questions like age, gender, race, etc. and got an email back from some random gmail with an invitation to participate. I show up the day of and while the lobby of the office building I was directed to wasn't such a huge red flag, it was a plain looking building and a lobby empty on the weekend didn't seem too ridiculous. But as soon as I got out of the elevator the lights were off in the hallway and some older dude that I didn't get a great look at but noticed he was in jeans evidently heard the elevator ding and yelled down the hall. If I was there, was there for the study. I got a bad feeling about it all suddenly, and I noped the hell out of there immediately and realized it was probably some sketchy shit to lure young women. I ran away and called the cops and I have never felt like such an idiot in all my days. The local police followed up with me about a week later saying they couldn't get anything off the Gmail obviously, but that the building was a soon-to-be office and was in the process of being leased up, but that it wasn't open yet and nobody was supposed to be in there. They were able to check the cameras and saw a young man coming in through the back door, go unlock the front lobby door and the elevator, and kind of stake out the general area of the third floor that was around the unit that I had been told to go to. And then they saw me coming in, I think they said maybe an hour later. They said the camera footage was grainy, the security was most likely lax because it was pretty much an empty building, and they have no idea who this guy was, but they think he was likely a construction worker and that's probably how he was able to get in.
If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And if you would like a chance to have your story featured in an upcoming video, make sure you email it to yourmaker6260 at gmail.com. And if you would like to help support the channel, make sure you check out the sponsor button down by the subscribe button. You will get a cool custom badge as well as some emotes for my live streams, as well as early access to all of my content. I appreciate everyone checking out this video, and I will also be doing a live stream on the 26th for my birthday. So about a week, a little less than. Not sure exactly what time it'll be, but go ahead and set your bell notification, that way you're notified when it's live. I will catch you all in the next video, and just remember, it's always scarier if it's true. Bad bye.